The Premature Burial There are certain themes of which the interest is all-absorbing, but which are too entirely horrible for the purposes of legitimate fiction. These the mere romanticist must eschew, if he do not wish to offend or to disgust. They are with propriety handled only when the severity and majesty of truth sanctify and sustain them. We thrill, for example, with the most intense of pleasurable pain over the accounts of the passage of the Beresina, of the earthquake at Lisbon, of the plague at London, of the massacre of St. Bartholomew, or of the stifling of the 123 prisoners in the black hole at Calcutta. But in these accounts it is the fact, it is the reality, it is the history which excites. As inventions, we should regard them with simple abhorrence. I have mentioned some few of the more prominent and august calamities on record, but in these it is extent, not less than the character of the calamity, which so vividly impresses the fancy. I need not remind the reader that from the long and weird catalogue of human miseries I might have selected many individual instances more replete with essential suffering than any of these vast generalities of disaster. The true wretchedness indeed, the ultimate woe, is particular, not diffuse. That the ghastly extremes of agony are endured by man the unit, and never by man the mass. For this, let us thank a merciful God. To be buried while alive is, beyond question, the most terrific of these extremes which has ever fallen to the lot of mere mortality. That it has frequently, very frequently, so fallen will scarcely be denied by those who think. The boundaries which divide life from death are at best shadowy and vague. Who shall say where the one ends and where the other begins? We know that there are diseases in which occur total cessations of all the apparent functions of vitality, and yet in which these cessations are merely suspensions, properly so called. They are only temporary pauses in the incomprehensible mechanism. A certain period elapses, and some unseen, mysterious principle again sets in motion the magic pinions and the wizard wheels. The silver cord was not for ever loosed, nor the golden bowl irreparably broken. But where, meantime, was the soul? Apart, however, from the inevitable conclusion, a priori that such causes must produce such effects, that the well-known occurrence of such cases of suspended animation must naturally give rise now and then to premature interments. Apart from this consideration, we have the direct testimony of medical and ordinary experience to prove that a vast number of such interments have actually taken place. I might refer at once, if necessary, to a hundred well-authenticated instances. One of a very remarkable character, and of which the circumstances may be fresh in the memory of some of my readers, occurred not very long ago in the neighbouring city of Baltimore, where it occasioned a painful, intense and widely extended excitement. The wife of one of the most respectable citizens, a lawyer of eminence and a member of Congress, was seized with a sudden and unaccountable illness which completely baffled the skill of her physicians. After much suffering she died, or was supposed to die. No one suspected indeed, or had reason to suspect, that she was not actually dead. She presented all the ordinary appearances of death, the face assumed the usual pinched and sunken outline, the lips were of the usual marble pallor, the eyes were lustreless. there was no warmth, pulsation had ceased. For three days the body was preserved unburied, during which it had acquired a stony rigidity. The funeral, in short, was hastened, on account of the rapid advance of what was supposed to be decomposition. The lady was deposited in her family vault, which for three subsequent years was undisturbed. At the expiration of this term it was opened for the reception of a sarcophagus, but alas, 
How fearful a shock awaited the husband, who personally threw open the door. As its portals swung outwardly back, some white apparelled object fell rattling within his arms. It was the skeleton of his wife, in her yet unmoulded shroud. A careful investigation rendered it evident that she had revived within two days after her entombment, that her struggles within the coffin had caused it to fall from a ledge or shelf to the floor where it was so broken as to permit her escape. A lamp, which had been accidentally left full of oil within the tomb, was found empty. It might have been exhausted, however, by evaporation. On the uppermost of the steps which led down to the dread chamber was a large fragment of the coffin, with which it seemed that she had endeavoured to arrest attention by striking the iron door. While thus occupied, she probably swooned, or possibly died, through sheer terror. And in falling, her shroud became entangled in some ironwork which projected interiorly. Thus she remained and thus she rotted, erect. In the year 1810, a case of living inhumation happened in France, attended with circumstances which go far to warrant the assertion that truth is indeed stranger than fiction. The heroine of the story was a Mademoiselle Victorine Lafourcade, a young girl of illustrious family, of wealth, and of great personal beauty. Among her numerous suitors was Julien Bossuet, a poor littérateur or journalist of Paris. His talents and general amiability had recommended him to the notice of the heiress, by whom he seems to have been truly beloved. But her pride of birth decided her finally to reject him and to wed a Monsieur Renel, a banker and a diplomatist of some eminence. After marriage, however, this gentleman neglected and perhaps even more positively ill-treated her. Having passed with him some wretched years, she died. At least her condition so closely resembled death as to deceive everyone who saw her. She was buried, not in a vault, but in an ordinary grave in the village of her nativity. Filled with despair and still inflamed by the memory of a profound attachment, the lover journeys from the capital to the remote province in which the village lies, with the romantic purpose of disinterring the corpse and possessing himself of its luxuriant tresses. He reaches the grave. At midnight he unearths the coffin, opens it, and is in the act of detaching the hair when he is arrested by the unclosing of the beloved eyes. In fact, the lady had been buried alive. Vitality had not altogether departed, and she was aroused by the caresses of her lover from the lethargy which had been mistaken for death. He bore her frantically to his lodgings in the village. He employed certain powerful restoratives suggested by no little medical learning. In fine, she revived. She recognized her preserver. She remained with him until, by slow degrees, she fully recovered her original health. Her woman's heart was not adamant, and this last lesson of love sufficed to soften it. She bestowed it upon Bossuet. She returned no more to her husband, but, concealing from him her resurrection, fled with her lover to America. Twenty years afterward, the two returned to France. In the persuasion that time had so greatly altered the lady's appearance that her friends would be unable to recognize her, they were mistaken, however.' 